Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we move on to the uh, session on uh, uh, metabolic dysfunction associated uh, fatty liver disease, the Asian perspective. And to talk to us on the clinical features, first we have Professor Sombat uh, the, from Thailand, and he's going to talk on MAFIL in patients living with HIV and PLWH. Uh, Professor Sambhaji. Thank you, uh, Professor Shawala, for in, uh, introductions. And I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to join this session. So my task today is to, to cover the, some specific of a method in Asia. I will uh, introduce you to the lean method, especially those with the people living with HIV or PLWH. This is my disclosure. And I have just uh, three uh, sub uh, topic for you to follow it. The first one, uh, just focus to the term of methyl, especially those with lean fatty liver. The second part is to summarize the preference uh, of fatty liver in PLWH. And the last one is to conclude the uh, current management focus on the lean methyl. As you can see from uh, this slide, uh, preference of methyl is quite a uh, high around one uh, one third or thirty percent around the world, and if you focus on the Asia as uh, our topic focus on, you can see that the preference is not quite different from other areas. And the key to of uh, this uh, data, you can see that the patient with MAFO usually have the BMI around twenty five to twenty six. And the preference is increasing rapidly during uh, these uh, 20 years. So for focusing on lean fatty liver, I think I will repeat the definition uh, that uh, Professor Jacob Josh just mentioned this morning. As you can see, the cutoff of normal BMI, uh, we use the ethnic specific cutoff 25 in Caucasians and 23 in Asian. The limitation of this cutoff is relied solely on the BMI, which is not a good indicator for body fatness, but anyhow, it's the simple test to use. And uh, you can see that the lean fatty liver is range between five to 26%. And in Asian country from several study, they show the higher preference, which is uh, quite interesting to follow. I want you to draw attention to this slide, especially those with lean fatty liver. As you can see from uh, the guideline of Asia Pacific, we divide the MAFO into three categories, overweight, lean fatty liver, and the last one is the group of diabetes. You can see that the lean fatty liver, which accounted around six to 20% with the cutoff BMI of less than 23, or normal weight BMI less than 25, we sometimes we call this is non-obese MAFO, uh, which is uh, commonly described in several articles published recently. Each subtype of fatty liver that I show you have a unique feature. That's why uh, this uh, category or this term of MAFO was uh, uh, consistently used and confirmed to be the term that we, uh, especially a parcel use MAFO instead of MAFO. And Professor Jacob George and uh, colleague uh, published the, the detail of this uh, guideline and mentioned about the concomitant MAFO with other liver disease, especially those with viral infection. HLE is uh, one of the good examples, especially those with lean fatty liver, which I will show you the data to support later. This is the study of a community setting screening for fatty liver in Thailand. We do the cohort study using CAP and transient elastography in general population with the list of diabetes, obesity, and abnormal liver, liver function. We exclude those with hepatitis B, C, and alcohol. The key important or the key uh, information of preference of fatty liver is around 1.5 or 80%. And around this, 5% of cohort have lean fatty liver. It's not so high. But the, interestingly, the, you can see that the preference of significant fibrosis or uh, F2 or above 
of this group is around 18 percent, which is quite high. So why we uh, want to focus on the lean fatty liver? As you can see from this summary uh, by the Professor Aslam and uh, Jacob George, you can see uh, it's basically three factors that contribute to the metabolic adaptation in patients with fatty liver. The first one is genetic, especially those with PNPLA3 G allele uh, abnormality. The second one uh, clearly is depend on the dietary intake, which is quite uh, commonly used right now in, in our society. It's uh, uh, high fat deliver, uh, high fatty food and high carb food. And the last one, which is uh, more data to support, is about the gut microbiota, which enrichment of a specific species that implicated in general of liver fat. And all of these three factors contributed to the presence of lean in patient with uh, fatty liver too. I think uh, this study or this abstract in 2014 presented in DDW draw us uh, quite uh, interesting to the lean fatty liver. As you can see from the huge number of patients, around 1,000 cases from UK, you can see that the result of lean fatty liver were more commonly in men, non concussion lower preference of diabetes, hypertension, hypertrichosis, and low HDL. But the highlight issue from this abstract is the cumulative survival was significantly shorter in lean fatty liver versus those with non-lean fatty liver. That's why I think uh, several uh, articles follow from, uh, from this uh, uh, highlight data from UK. So we have to proof or to validate this study. But I didn't see the full article from this study yet. Subsequent study in 2018, uh, you can see from Sweden around uh, 600 cases uh, with biopsy proven fatty liver, and they want to investigate the long-term prognosis of proven lean fatty liver. And you can see from the comparison dose with BMI less than 25 and, and uh, non-lean group. As you can see, the conclusion from the table, they conclude that lean fatty liver had lower state of fibrosis, but higher risk for development of severe liver disease versus those with higher BMI, independent of available confounder. So there are some conflicting results though. Uh, we need more information from other area to prove this concept that lean fatty liver have worsened survival than other groups or not. And this one uh, study that uh, we call Go Asia, collaborating between uh, our country and uh, around eight uh, countries in Asia Pacific, which is the largest multi center biopsy proven cases, uh, around 1,800 cases. Uh, leading by Professor Chang, which is the next speaker. And uh, focusing on lean fatty liver uh, by uh, Dr. Tan and group, you can see that the mean age of this group of studies is around 78 years old with BMI about 29%. But if we cut off those with non-obese or less than 25, comparing with those with obese, as you can see, the metabolic syndrome in non-obese was associated with NASH with odd ratio about 1.6 and advanced fibrosis with odd ratio about 1.9. So this, this is another evidence to support that metabolic syndrome is one of the key parameter to follow with, especially those with uh, lean fat deliver. And recently study uh, presented uh, by the Professor Chang and uh, the group they try to do the risk certification for MAFO, which are huge number of cases, around one, uh, 10,000 cases in the third NHN East from United States. And they divide in the patient to three groups, fatty liver negative, ma uh, MAFO ne negative, and MAFO positive, with a long duration of follow-up of 23 years. Uh, the outcome of uh, this group, there are about 3,000 cases that did during the study. As you can see, MAFO individually had higher or cost mortality uh, with hazard ratio of 1.3, as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side. 
And when we divide into the group with the subtype, you can see that the high risk fatty liver is identified in around 15%. And uh, by subtype, and you can use a non-invasive test to classify, such as in this study, they use API score. And you can see on the right-hand side figure, the lean fatty liver, which is allow 8% of this cohort, have a hazard ratio of 1.3 for the worst outcome or, or worst hour, uh, overall mortality. This, again, to highlight the importance of uh, the lean fatty liver. So... Uh, to conclude this one, from all evidence that I show you, the uh, clinical practice update from gastroenterology in 2022, they conclude that lean fatty liver as defined by normal BMI, as I mentioned already, and appear to be older, more men, and often Asian, and have fewer components of metabolic syndrome. This is uh, the key uh, information for, for you to, to, take, to uh, take care of your patients. And so when we know that, what we can do regarding to the diagnosis and management by back best practice guideline, uh, who to be screened as a best practice uh, management uh, advice, you can see that from the uh, highlight that I show you, the lean individual with fatty liver should be least certified for hepatic fibrosis to identify those with advanced fibrosis or F3 and F4. However, the lean individual in general population should not undergo routine screening for fatty liver, except those with older than 40 with type 2 diabetes that clearly show some metabolic uh, disorder. And fatty liver should be considered in lean, fatty, in lean individual with metabolic disease such as type 2 DM, dyslipidemia, and hypertension, abnormal liver test, and and all incident noted hepatic steatosis by imaging. And which tool that uh, we can use for screening if uh, the category has a high risk cases. From advice nine and 10, you can see that liver biopsy as a reference and that should be considered as a first step. But however, that as we know in clinical practice, it's quite difficult to react to patients who underwent uh, liver biopsy. So non-invasive tests, including FIT4 and NFS or NAFO uh, fibrosis score, or imaging such as transient elastography, TE, or MRE may be used as alternatives for liver biopsy. And the better of uh, uh, NIT that, uh, is that you can repeat it at interval of six, to, six months to two years to see the progression of liver disease. That's why this uh, is the rising tool for screening right now in clinical practice. How about the uh, ROC or uh, uh, accuracy of NIT against liver histology uh, in this group of patients? This is uh, the study done recently in 2022. And as you can see, those with BMI less than 25 from two studies, the first one uh, by four and the second one by Moses. As you can see, FIT4 and FS or liver sickness measurement show very high uh, accuracy for detected uh, uh, fibrosis, significant fibrosis or advanced fibrosis. And uh, better than, uh, uh, in general, it's worked pretty well, but as you can see, uh, it's performed better in patients with lower BMI. Again, if you focus in detail, the liver state net measurement show the best uh, area under the curve, uh, AUC. I try to move on to the next one, the next topic that how to link lean fatty liver with those with uh, people living with HIV. As you can see from uh, these two study, especially from the uh, United States with a huge number and uh, egg center or uh, 31 center in US, uh, the number of cases is between 300 and 300 cases. As you can see, the preference of fatty liver is around 21 to 40 percent, and significant fibrosis is around 15 percent. Most of the patients that enroll in this study have a good CD4 count and undetected HIV RNA. And both of study uh, try to conclude that this may be affected by the antiretroviral agent, but 
again, maybe some parts of uh, genetic factor and also metabolic syndrome that are uh, more prevalent in this group of patients. Uh, this is uh, the recent uh, study in DDW 2023, and they tried to look in further detail, and they found that uh, the predictor of fatty liver in, in this group of patients with HIV, they found that there is, there is no difference in HIV or ART-specific factor by natural status, and significant fibrosis was higher in patients living with HIV. And... Uh, as you can see, the higher BMI, breast circumference, triglyceride, and diabetes associated with higher odds of fatty liver. And again, associated with clinical sick fibrosis. So this is this trial is a huge one, and then we uh, want to follow the full article. In, I think it's the near future it should uh, come out. How about the result of this group in Thailand? We did a study, uh, to study one in uh, with the uh, HIV uh, clinicians, include around 800 cases. And the second one is, uh, includes just only 100 cases in communities. And you can see the result that the preference of uh, all the fibrosis percentage in fatty liver is quite high. It's about 11% and 46%. The second pass is quite high because it's a select group of uh, patients living with HIV with uh, duration of uh, ART more than two years. So this is um, of a key element that we need to uh, to uh, mention. You cannot uh, compare each other because this is maybe a little bit select cases to, to include in the study. And this abstract just present this morning just to remind you and confirm that from the study that I just showed you, the lean fatty liver in this group is around one third or 29%. So it's quite preference experience those with patients living with HIV. So we know all the criteria to screening, which should that we use, especially in IT such as API, F, F, uh, FIP4 and NFS. So what can we do in uh, regarding to the management? As you can see, some key point that uh, you should remember is just to go to uh, at Y patient for weight reduction is uh, reduced to only three to 5%. As a, a logic, logical uh, thinking is to be, depend on the best life body weight. And the second one is vitamin E may be considered in lean person with biopsy confirmed. Oral pyocritazone may be considered. Why, why, why they suggest like that? Because there are no uh, the clinical try to focus only on those patients with lean fatty liver. But the other types of medications, uh, GLP-1, and other kinds of uh, medications, such as SGLT-2, that use commonly used in diabetes, is not fully defined and require further study to confirm. And if we focus in further detail, just only those with patients living with HIV, there's just one study that I can find, uh, just single small study, and they show that if uh, we treat this patient with cap above 250 and treat with 800 IU per day with vitamin E for 24 weeks, follow for additional 24 weeks post discontinuation. As you can see from the figure, uh, compared with the uh, best line, 24 weeks of vitamin E treatment show the improvement in ALT, cap score, but no change in BMI and no serious side effect. So if you want to try, you can, but the limitation is very small number of cases to, to uh, be the uh, evidence for support. And as I mentioned, GLP-1 analog, there is no clinical data to support. So keep in mind and be cautious about the uh, side effect, expiry inhibit gastric acid secretion and cause some uh, gastric uh, delaying uh, so if uh, the patient underwent to endoscopy or other surgery, maybe the problem cases. So I think uh, this is quite a uh, nice uh, article uh, uh, led by the Professor Chan to know about the lean fatty liver versus those with obesity. obesity. As you can see, and I summarized already, FIT4 can work pretty well with high AURC. And to get 50% achieved remission of fatty liver, 
lifestyle modification with 3 to 5% weight reduction is the key comparing to other groups such as obesity with aim to 10%. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude and to uh, bring you the take home message. In lean fatty liver, definitely other cause of liver disease you should be ruled out, including other cause of fatty liver especially those with HIV and other uh, family-related diseases, especially medication in the hepatic fibrosis or cetosis. NIT tests, uh, including scrolling system and TE or MIE, may be used as alternative uh, to liver biopsy. And those lean fatty liver with patient, uh, people living with HIV have a high preference of lean fatty liver with significant fibrosis. And in Thailand, studies include around one-third. Treatment, you can use lifestyle modification with the cut of, uh, of uh, 3 to 5% of uh, weight reduction. Vitamin E may be considered, but other medication is limit study to suggest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sambat, for uh, taking us through the uh, clinical features of uh, uh, metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease and the uh, 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 HIV group of patients. So uh, before I uh, ask the audience to uh, ask questions or comments, I just forgot mentioning that Professor Sombat is Professor of Internal Medicine uh, at the uh, University in Thailand, Chulagongkorn, and he's also assistant to the president there for cross functions. He did his MD, MSc, and PhD in medicine from Mayo Clinic, and he's a highly accomplished uh, hepatologist. So uh, let's open the uh, talk to questions. Professor Kim, just, just a moment. So we'll finish his uh, thing, and I'll invite you. Any questions for uh, Professor Sombat? You know, uh, we always say that uh, uh, Mafeld is about 30% of the general population. But in India, we have seen that um, the prevalence is higher than 30%. And I'm sure it must be the same in your country as well. It had gone up to 60 to 70% when you do an ultrasound. So I was just wondering... Uh, 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 can pioglitazone be used in these patients? One of the reasons why we don't prefer pioglitazone is it increases the weight. Mm -hmm. At one moment of time, you're trying to decrease the weight in patients with uh, Mafeld. But since these patients are lean, do you think pioglitazone could be a better alternative than vitamin E? Yeah, I agree with your chairperson that uh, there are some very limited study to focus on low the of the pyogritazone in lean fatty liver. But as uh, I mentioned, if you have lean fatty liver with metabolic derangement, especially those with diabetes, you can try. But as we know very well, the, the leg edema is very commonly found by using this medication. So keep in mind things. Right. And uh, uh, the reason that you gave for uh, increased mafeld in uh, HIV is but what are the reasons? The HIV RNA could be one factor. What else? Uh, why is there so much of steatosis? In yeah, that's a very good question. Because as you know, a patient living with HIV right now, the top three common cause of death and uh, uh, mortality is the, the liver disease. And as you know, this group of patients have a core uh, infection such as HIV root, hepatitis B or C, or fatty liver. So if you have three uh, components come together, that's a higher risk for liver fibrosis or progression. So that's why I think so. we should uh, keep in mind that this group are the target for screening with, not only the general population. That's why I try to emphasize on liver fatty liver and people living with HIV. Okay, thank you very much, thank uh, you. Professor Sombat. So. We now invite the second speaker, that is uh, Dr. Hong Su Kim. He is professor of hepatology at uh, 
Sun Chun Hyang University Hospital in Korea. His areas of interest are surveillance of HCC, local ablation therapy, and he's also involved in the national health insurance policy in Korea and has a lot of other honors and awards. So, if, uh, Professor Kim, let's listen to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph, for your kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here in the Pacific, is a very beautiful, glorious city and wonderful meeting. Today, the title of my presentation is How to Follow Up Patient is Method. To avoid confusion, I would like to make clear that the Nafold Nash have been replaced with the recent nomenclature Method Mesh in my presentation. As you can see here, the prevalence of fatty liver disease in Korea has been increased. This is a summary slide of the epidemiology and the incidence of the Naples in Korea. The annual incidence of Naples in Korea about the 45 cases for 100 persons. The prevalence of Naples in Korea is approximately 30 percent. The prevalence of Naples in the domestic non-obese population is about uh, 90%. This data shows very similarity in Japan. It is sl slightly higher than the America, even though we are not fat. This is overview of my talk. Number one, diagnosis of methyl mesh. The, the, uh, when you screen the general population of Mayfield, one third of Asian population is being targeted. So all guidelines don't recommend screening the general population without risk of the Mayfield. This slide shows a significant increase the number of the ultrasound screen after medical insurance coverage of ultrasound in, in Korea. It may be ultrasonogram in, in Korea increased number of diagnoses. It lead to increased number of diagnoses of Mayfield in Korea. Either guideline do not recommend non-invasive scoring test, including a APRI and FIB4 for diagnosis of steatosis of clinical practice. Basically, the possible diagnosis steatosis with ultrasound. The Korean guideline for diagnosis of Mayfield mesh is as follows. Subjects who have persistent liver enzyme elevation of diabetes, all diabetes should be screened. Subject with metabolic syndrome can be considered for screening. Abdominal ultrasonography is a prime screening modality. Ultrasound diagnosis method requires increased echogenicity and increased hepatodrenal index, heterogeneous change in the liver parenchyma, and loss of the echogenic wall in the portal vein. Increased hepatodrenal index is a very simple and important finding of the ultrasound diagnosis of the method. Mild hepatic steatosis is detectable by increased hepatodrenal index but in ultrasound when 20% more than hepatocyte contained lipid droplet. So ultrasound have uh, some limitation to detect mild steatosis, even though it is primary modality to diagnosis. MESH is a historic diagnosis require liver biopsy. However, liver biopsy is impractical to apply the large maceal population due to its invasiveness. We need to non invasive test for diagnosis, staging, and longitudinal monitoring of maceal instead of liver biopsy. We have a two-step approach of maceal. One, first, is, the, is there steatosis by ultrasonogram? Second, how much fibrosis is there? 
by non-invasive test, including image, lab, nomographic factor. Individual risk stratification by non-invasive test is important for the diagnosis of MASH. Number two, significance of liver fat quantification. Quantify liver fat content is not generally recommend in the MASH. However, it holds the clinical significance despite this recommendation. The reason for evaluating statosis, assessment to presence of statosis, significance statosis may correlate with fibrosis. Kept over the 30, 100, overestimate advantage liver fibrosis risk. This slide shows that the CAP measurement can quantify hepatic steatosis. CAP greater than 250 suggests steatosis. First is a score based fibrosis, steatosis, and inflammation can be used to detect the patient with the active NASH and significant fibrosis. This means significant steatosis can be associated with progression of fibrosis. Fat quantification would help in monitoring impact of intervention because fat content more than one cause of the including metabolic syndrome, it may be hold the progress value, but its progress value is unknown. Three, number three, monitoring fibrous and mesild. This slide showed the only fibrous stage was it associated over modality, liver transplantation, and liver related events. That's why monitoring fibrous is so important to mesild. According to ASLD EASY guideline, you can use the NAFLD fibrous score, FI4, and elastography to measure the liver stiffness. Using the sequential test could redu reduce the number of the patient in the intermediate zone. It is more accurate for maceled than single or simultaneous test. Number four, proposal of follow-up fiber scan. Follow-up fiber scan is required for acute validation and monitoring of the fibrosis and steatosis, and evaluation of the response to treatment. Cerebral compound factor influence the result of liver stiffness, liver inflammation, steatosis, cholestasis, heart failure, and postprandial condition can lead to overdiagnosis of advanced chronic liver disease. So, we need follow-up fiber scan to make an acute diagnosis. Mesild is a slow progressive disease, but mesh with advanced hepatic fibrosis may quickly progress to cirrhosis. That's why there are no accepted consensus for monitoring patients with mesild. Follow-up fiber scan required to assess treatment response Weight loss of more than 10% result or 45 fibrous reduction. Number five, AC surveillance of MACID. MACID is the new raging cause of HCC in Korea, approximately over the 10%. This slide is actually adjusted survival curve after HCC diagnosis. The survival curve showed that the patient with HC related with MACILD had the lowest survival rate. MACILD related HC to occur in older individuals and to be diagnosed to be later stage. MACILD HC associated with progress factor. In patient with cirrhosis, the absence of AC surveillance protocol contributed to late diagnosis and management. In patient with cirrhosis with MACILD, 
Surveillance Failure May Cause Poor Performance. This is slide simplified mechanism of Macy's related HD development. While HC surveillance is standard for Macy's with cirrhosis, it is not recommended for the Macy's without cirrhosis. However, approximately 30% of Macy's HC do not have cirrhosis. Macy's is a leading cause of HC in the absence of fibrosis, cirrhosis, or HB infection. Old age, male, advanced fibrosis, diabetes, moderate alcohol intake, is a risk factor of Macy's HC without cirrhosis. The target of Macy's HC surveillance is uh, cirrhosis, not excluding mild fibrosis. Current AGA EASY guideline recommends HC surveillance of Macy's patients with F3 fibrosis. The Korean guidelines do not recommend HC surveillance with Macy's patients with advanced fibrosis F3. HC surveillance with by a UR ultrasound with or without alpha protein in patient with cirrhosis is not recommended. It is recommended regardless of at cause of liver cancer. But alpha protein is have a limited uh, data of efficiency of surveillance HC in Naples. <laughs> ultrasound based surveillance of HC. The ultrasound quality can be inadequate for HC surveillance in the patient of nephrosis cirrhosis due to obesity and uh, subcutaneous fat and fat liver fat infiltration. So high quality ultrasonogram and CT MRI select patient can improve HC surveillance. In summary, B-mode ultrasound can identify patient with nephrosis. Fibro scan can identify patient high risk for mesh. Depending on the stage of fibrosis, patients with method related advanced fibrosis require individual light follow-up. Patients with method related cirrhosis require HC surveillance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kim, for uh, telling us how to monitor these patients uh, of uh, Maffield. So, can we have some questions from the audience? Any comments? You know, one of the main uh, issues that we all, as you mentioned, uh, want to know in a patient with uh, uh, Massel is whether there is evidence of fibrosis or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from uh, Fib4, and uh, fibro scan. What are the other modalities that can help you? Uh, uh, suppose if uh, uh, money is not a problem, if you have enough yeah, yeah. money, ideally you should pick up cases with mash and fibrosis so that you can treat these patients and you can stratify them for uh, more vigorous uh, therapy. So uh, are you aware of any other modalities which tell you whether MASH is there or not, steatohepatitis? We are focused to cost-effectiveness screen of HCC of Mayfield. My side shows the increased number of ultrasonograms needed to increase the diagnosis Mayfield. But what about the HCC screening? Which is the best method of the uh, Nafield HCC, because uh, we don't have any data. It's available by your alphabet protein and ultrasonogram. It's a very difficult question for me, <laughs> but I recommend you individual, especially if you have a, if, if the patient have a family story of HCC, I strongly recommend surveillance, even though it's not documentation, any data. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Kim, for an excellent talk. We now come to the third talk, which is going to be given by uh, Professor Chan, who is 
a senior gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the Malay Medical Center and University here, Malaysia. He has main interest in Massild and has a lot of uh, contributions, honors, and awards in the field of hepatology. So he's one of the rising stars of hepatology, already risen though. And uh, let's listen to him on Maffeld clinical features and implications. Professor Chen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chawla, for your very kind introduction. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Chawla was actually my uh, examiner for my PhD uh, more than 10 years ago. And uh, it's really an honor for me uh, to present here uh, with him chairing the session today. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the organizer uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so over the next 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll address uh, Mafodi uh, clinical features and implications. So these are my disclosures. So as we know, uh, in 2020, uh, the term metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease or MAFLD was introduced and it was endorsed by the Asia Pacific Association for the Study of Liver, uh, including uh, our own Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology and Hepatology quite quickly uh, after the, the concept was introduced. So uh, MAFLD is diagnosed uh, in patients uh, with excess accumulation of fat in the liver in the presence of either overweight or obesity type 2 diabetes, or at least uh, two metabolic risk abnormalities. And the metabolic risk abnormalities are really the components uh, of the metabolic syndrome. And in ad addition to that, uh, elevation in HOMA IR, as well as elevation in HSCRP level. So the term MAFLD and its definition really give us a positive diagnostic criteria and attribute the disease to its underlying etiology. It tells us what it is rather than what it is not, uh, unlike the older term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD. In June uh, 2023, uh, last year, uh, through a consensus uh, process led by the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the European Association for the Study of Liver, uh, the term metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease or MASLD was introduced. And muscle D is diagnosed in a person who has excess accumulation of fat in the liver in the presence of at least one cardiometabolic risk factors. And indeed, these are uh, the same criteria for the metabolic syndrome, with the exception that uh, overweight or obesity as defined by body mass index is included alongside central obesity. Besides the difference in the diagnostic criteria, there's also another important uh, difference in the sense that there's a distinct group uh, called MED-ALD or muscle D and increased alcohol intake, uh, which represent patients who has muscle D as well as increased alcohol intake, more than 20 gram uh, per day for female and 30 gram per day for male. There are some uh, uh, minor issues uh, in relation to having this distinct group. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as we know in alcohol-related liver disease, uh, the exact threshold uh, that may cause significant liver injury can vary uh, between individuals. Number two, the pattern as well as amount of alcohol intake can vary over time. And if you look carefully at this uh, uh, diagram, which I'm sure uh, all of you have seen it repeatedly, you'll see that in the med ALD group, the maximum amount of alcohol intake in the med ALD group is 50 gram per day for female and 60 gram per day for male. This leads us to interpret that patient with more alcohol intake than that amount would be considered as alcohol-related liver disease. Even though uh, they have features of uh, cardiometabolic uh, risk abnormalities. So this is something uh, that we should keep in mind when we look at the two different uh, nomenclature. So again, both MAFLD and MASLD has positive diagnostic criteria. They attribute the underlying condition to its etiology, which I think is very important because both recognizes metabolic dysfunction as the underlying cause so that we can together with other colleagues who are involved in managing uh, the multi-faceted uh, manifestation of this condition together. However, there are small differences in the diagnostic criteria, which I'll touch on uh, in my next few slides. And also do remember 
that for the term muffle D, other concomitant liver disease retain their own mean, whereas in muscle D, uh, patients who have other concomitant liver disease, they fall under separate and distinct category, for example, MET-ALD. And for those who even have fatty liver as well as metabolic dysfunction, who consume even larger amount of alcohol, they will be considered as alcohol-related related liver disease and not muscle D. So again, this is a cartoon uh, simplifying that uh, muffle D uh, is uh, diagnosed based on presence of either overweight or obesity, type 2 diabetes, or at least two metabolic risk abnormalities, while muscle D is diagnosed uh, based on only one cardiometabolic risk abnormalities, and MET-ALD uh, is considered as a separate group, all, group altogether, including a group of patients who has metabolic dysfunction but will be considered as alcohol-related liver disease because of higher amount of alcohol intake. So I'd like to just uh, go through a few uh, points about the differences in the diagnostic criteria. The criteria for a metabolic dysfunction for muscle D uh, may in fact be too relaxed. So in this uh, large study involving more than 3,000 participants in the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, where patients underwent transient elastography and hepatic steatosis was di defined by control attenuation parameter more than 274 decibel per meter, we can see that the criteria for metabolic dysfunction for muscle D was actually present in 91% of the general population. That's a very high proportion of people. And among those patients who did not have elastographic feature of hepatic steatosis, yet we will see that 85% of them actually fulfill at least one of the cardiometabolic risk factors. And when we look at uh, only those patients who were normal weight, Okay, you can see that 68% of these patients uh, actually fulfill the, uh, at least one uh, cardiometabolic uh, risk uh, factors. But when we look at HOMA IR, only a small proportion, 16% of them, really had insulin resistance, which we know is the underlying uh, uh, patho uh, patho pathology that we see in patients uh, with this disease. I also like to... Uh, show this uh, nice study uh, done here in Japan on over 700 uh, patients uh, who had fatty liver, where significant fibrosis was defined by FIFO index more than 1.4, or liver stiffness more than 6.6 .6 kilopascal. And as you can see here, uh, when the muffle D uh, term and definition was used, it actually better identified those patients who had significant fibrosis compared with the term muffle D. And if you look at it, uh, the... Uh, term muscle D because of the very relaxed uh, criteria, most of the patients who fulfill the criteria for uh, muscle D would fulfill the criteria for nuffle D, except for a very, very small negligible minority. And in the interval between introduction of the term muscle D and muscle D, many studies have been done, which clearly shows that the term muscle D compared with the term nuffle D actually has uh, advantages in terms of uh, predicting significant fibrosis as well as outcome, which I'll be sharing uh, with you shortly. However, if you want to compare directly with the term muscle D, the jury is still out. So it's important for future uh, study to actually report uh, on both uh, muscle D and muscle D so that we can actually have a direct comparison uh, of the two uh, terms. Here is another study on nearly 1,000 patients uh, uh, who are diagnosed with muscle D using the different uh, uh, criteria, overweight or obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, or at least two metabolic risk abnormalities. And one important finding in this study is that these three groups uh, have very different uh, ability to predict a more severe liver disease. With patients who have uh, muscle D diagnosed based on the presence of diabetes, having a much higher proportion of patients who have significant liver fibrosis. And when they look uh, further in detail, independent factors that were found to be associated with significant fibrosis included serum ferritin level, fibrosis 4 index, HOMA IR, metabolic syndrome, and importantly, uh, the presence of type 2 diabetes. So this is another study uh, which is based on the third National Health and uh, Nutritional Examination Survey of 11,000 participants who were followed for a median of 23 years. And uh, this study found that muscle D predicted all-cause mortality. And when they looked separately uh, among patients uh, who had 
a significant alcohol intake and did not have significant alcohol intake, uh, Mafodi similarly predict uh, increased uh, risk of all-cause mortality. Another important finding of this study is that if you look at the different diagnostic group uh, for the patient uh, to be diagnosed with MAFLD again, you can see diabetes uh, emerge as an important uh, uh, factor uh, in uh, causing the uh, increase in all-cause mortality. So this is a study which uh, Professor Sombat has mentioned earlier, uh, uh, done uh, in the Go Asia group, uh, several centers across the Asia Pacific region, where we, stu we studied the clinical features of patients who had uh, liver bi uh, patient with NAFLD who had liver biopsy, and we found that uh, the risk factor for uh, stadium hepatitis, the more severe form uh, of the disease, uh, include diabetes, and the risk factor for advanced liver fibrosis again uh, include diabetes. We also conducted a study in uh, our pa uh, patient with diabetes attending the diabetes clinic in uh, our hospital. We found a very high proportion of patients uh, having uh, excess accumulation of fat in the liver and uh, a high proportion of patients, over 20%, having advanced liver fibrosis based on liver stiffness measurement. And when those patients who have liver stiffness measurement more than 8 kilopascal were referred uh, to our gastroenterology and hepatology clinic for further assessment, uh, and among those who actually underwent a liver biopsy, most of which uh, whom had higher liver stiffness measurement, uh, we found that the majority of them uh, had stator hepatitis and at least some degree of fibrosis with over one third having uh, histologically confirmed advanced liver fibrosis. So again, all these uh, studies uh, show us that patients with uh, type 2 diabetes really represent an important target group uh, to identify more severe MAFLD, uh, which is also why uh, our... Uh, National uh, Type 2 uh, Diabetes uh, Clinical Practice Guideline has included a section uh, on assessment uh, of uh, fatty liver as early as uh, uh, 2020. So, uh, in fact, in Malaysia, uh, the uh, Endocrine Society were the first uh, to actually have a guideline on assessment of fatty liver, only subsequently to be followed by our Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. So, as, as we all know, a patient with uh, MAFLD, uh, uh, can develop a liver-related complication and mortality, but we know that uh, the patients who tend to develop this are those patients with more advanced uh, liver disease, uh, and this occurs in a relatively small proportion of patients. But patients with MAFLD are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which we know is the leading cause of mortality. So it's very important that uh, there is a clear assessment uh, and referral pathway uh, for our primary care endocrinology colleague to follow so that patients with less severe uh, liver disease can uh, remain in primary care or endocrinology where they are best managed uh, and those with more severe liver disease can be referred to gastroenterology and hepatology. So uh, in uh, Malaysia, we use uh, the fibrosis 4 index as the first test. Uh, those with low fibrosis 4 index uh, will be considered to be unlikely to have advanced fibrosis, while those with elevated uh, Fibrosis 4 uh, index uh, will require a second test, in this case, a liver stiffness measurement. Uh, those with less than 10 kilopascal, uh, we exclude, uh, uh, we follow the uh, concept of uh, Bavino, compensated uh, advanced chronic liver disease, whereas those who have higher liver stiffness measurement can be considered for referral to gastroenterology and hepatology care. Uh, this is uh, this slide is just to uh, highlight again uh, that cardiovascular disease is something that we should not overlook in our patients with MAFLD. Uh, this study was conducted on over 200 patients with MAFLD who underwent a baseline liver biopsy. They were uh, followed for a median of seven years. At baseline, uh, more than three quarters of these patients actually had more severe uh, fatty liver disease. Uh, they had steatohepatitis, hepatitis, and more than one quarter of them actually had advanced liver fibrosis. But what you can see here, the liver-related event is really very low, 0 0.43 per 100 person year. And it only occurred, uh, um, they, this only occurred among patients with advanced liver fibrosis. On the other hand, cardiovascular event rate was uh, 2.03 per 100 person years, uh, much higher uh, than liver-related event. So I'd just like to move on to talk a bit about uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease. This is what we uh, uh, understand and practice uh, nowadays. In primary prevention, we prevent the onset of cardiovascular disease. If you see a patient with hypertension, if you see a patient with dyslipidemia or diabetes, uh, you, will uh, you may uh, calculate the cardiovascular risk score, get all these risk factors under control. The aim is really to prevent uh, onset of cardiovascular disease. 
And among those patients who already have, for example, an acute coronary syndrome, uh, we uh, talk about secondary prevention. But if we were to uh, follow what is being done to prevent uh, HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma, primary prevention start even before the hepatitis B infection is acquired. You, you have listened to many uh, excellent lectures uh, during this conference about how uh, uh, vaccination uh, and uh, use of antiviral during third trimester uh, can reduce the risk of transmission. Uh, and uh, many years ago, uh, the uh, introduction of vaccination uh, already show a reduction uh, in the incidence of liver cancer among uh, a population where hepatitis B uh, has a very high prevalence. So uh, why not consider that uh, primary prevention should even start at the pre uh, by preventing the onset of metabolic syndrome instead uh, of uh, it being preventing the onset of cardiovascular disease? So this concept uh, has... Uh, kind of been taken up uh, by the American Heart Association. They have introduced the concept of life's essential aid. Uh, you can see here, these are actually, in fact, all a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and for each of these component, uh, diet, so it will be an ideal dietary plan, physical activity, more than 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week, uh, nicotine exposure, never smoke, sleep, at least seven to nine hours per week, body weight less than 25 kilogram per meter squared, blood lipids, blood glucose, blood, blood pressure, all uh, within a good control. So this will score the patient uh, uh, the highest score. Of course, there are different uh, grading uh, for each of these components. And based on that, uh, the overall cardiovascular health uh, will be calculated. And this concept is really to try to uh, uh, promote and uh, preserve uh, metabolic health uh, across uh, the, uh, uh, the whole uh, entire life. And we could apply uh, the same concept uh, to liver disease as well. Primary prevention is to prevent uh, uh, nephrody patients from developing advanced liver disease. Secondary prevention intervention to prevent nephrody patients from complication and mortality. But why not uh, primary prevention be preventing the onset of metabolic syndrome? Uh, after all, many of the modern day diseases that we see nowadays stems uh, from metabolic dysfunction and would benefit uh, from this approach. We are now really living in an obesogenic environment. Uh, you know, the, the condition is really driven largely uh, uh, by environmental factors which undermine the self-regulatory capacity that people have to make responsible decisions about personal diet uh, and physical activity. So uh, the average uh, BMI of mankind has increased uh, over the years uh, because of the obesogenic uh, environment. And there are many factors beyond uh, the individual that actually influence uh, their dietary choices, uh, whether they are able to uh, lead a, an active life. And, and we could use the social ecological model as a framework for us to understand uh, these factors better so that we can provide a more holistic approach uh, and solution to issues uh, related to health behaviors. So for example, if you have a patient with Mafodi who is keen to eat healthy and increase his physical activity, Unfortunately, none of the family members or friends share similar intention. Okay, there's no healthy food choices at work, long working hours, staying far from the workplace, and heavy traffic. You know, a lot of us uh, travel a lot, uh, but uh, we actually uh, moving sedentarily or sedentary on the move, sitting in the car uh, with uh, no, not much of uh, physical activity. Okay, and uh, in terms of uh, community, uh, society level, uh, there may be lack of regulation that promote uh, healthier food choices. So uh, you can actually read more uh, uh, on, on this uh, in this document uh, by the American Heart Association. Uh, it touches on the uh, many time windows in one's uh, life course uh, that can be tackled uh, to improve cardiovascular health. And I think uh, uh, this may also be applicable uh, to other uh, diseases related uh, to metabolic dysfunction, including muscle D. Uh, so, Mr. Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, there, are, there are differences in the new nomenclatures uh, that deserve cons consideration, but both represent a clear recognition of the bigger problem related to excess adiposity, insulin resistance, and low-grade meta-inflammation. And they, there must be increasing focus on lifestyle habit for promoting and preserving metabolic health during the entire life course at the individual level and beyond. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, a really masterly talk. Uh, can we have some comments or questions from the audience? I'll start off, uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, in the definition of massel, do you include alcohol uh, in it? 20 grams or 30 grams? Is that included or not? So uh, in the muscle definition, as long as a person has fatty liver uh, and has uh, at least one of the cardiometabolic risk factor, they'll be uh, died. Uh, and you need to quantify the alcohol intake. If they do not consume more than 20 gram uh, per day for female and 30 gram per day for male, then you will diagnose uh, muscle D. I, am, I, I have uh, always had doubts in my mind. Why include alcohol at all? Because it has been shown in studies that even 20 grams tends to produce a fatty liver and confuse the whole aspect. But I leave it to the experts who are working on this. But this is something which always bothered me. Second question is, uh, uh, we keep on doing transient elastography. Is there a correlation between the amount of fat in cap and the fibrosis score? Because in clinical practice, we have seen that once you bring down the cap, even the fibrosis score decreases. So what is the correlation between the two? Yes. Thank you for the question. So in terms of the alcohol uh, being included, uh, yes, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, the threshold that can cause liver injury is uh, it's not very clear and it, it obviously will vary between individuals. Uh, and uh, to actually... Uh, use need to use uh, alcohol uh, intake uh, to then define whether a patient has muscle D or not, uh, make it more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, we, we know that uh, causes of different causes of chronic uh, liver disease can coexist. So if we use the muscle D definition, we can just establish it uh, prior to even knowing uh, what's the alcohol intake like. But of course, if the patient consumes significant amount of alcohol, the patient also has alcohol-related liver disease. And, and uh, these are issues that are still uh, present in the field of uh, uh, alcohol-related liver disease. You know, uh, what is the real cutoff? Uh, and we know uh, pattern and uh, amount of alcohol intake varies. Uh, and uh, another important factor would be uh, the fact that during the consensus process, it's mainly involving pe uh, people who are involved in fatty liver research. Uh, I'm not sure whether our colleague in alcohol-related research are happy that with this uh, new uh, nomenclature, uh, a lot of the alcohol-related liver disease patients will now uh, have a new uh, a name, uh, met ald I, I really don't know about that. Okay. About the second question that I asked uh, on CAP and uh, fibrosis score. Yes. So uh, with increased amount of steatosis, uh, there will be several factors that could lead to an increased liver stiffness measurement. Uh, so patients who have a, a lot of fat in the liver may be more likely to have uh, inflammation going on. That can drive uh, the uh, stiffness measurement to go up. Uh, patients who have a lot of fat in the liver may also have a uh, greater uh, subcapsular distance. Uh, that can also uh, drive uh, the liver stiffness up. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. There's a question from yes. the floor. Yes, uh, Judith Ertler, Böhringer Ingelheim, Germany. I have a question regarding a nice, very good overview of Nephilim. Um, I have a question regarding I stay with alcohol. Um, can you say, uh, allude a little bit on the difference between continuous drinking and binge drinking, what that would have an effect on, on MESLD? Um, or met ALD, and then also in regards of diabetes, as that is one of the biggest risk factor. Whether how is well controlled versus not well controlled diabetes affecting MESLD? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so, in terms of alcohol intake, uh, study have clearly shown that uh, binge drinking can also contribute uh, to uh, uh, worsening of uh, liver disease, uh, not only uh, people who consume uh, alcohol uh, continuously. Uh, and again, uh, the threshold uh, uh, is not very clear, especially if you look at it on an individual basis. Uh, the second question about uh, diabetes, certainly if we have patients with poorly controlled diabetes, it's much more likely uh, that they have a more severe liver disease uh, in the form of uh, steatohepatitis uh, as well as a progression uh, and uh, having uh, more fibrosis. 
I think that's a very important question that she raised. We always talk of uh, diabetes predisposes in patients with massel to HCC development. So would HCC development be less in patients who have controlled diabetes versus those with uncontrolled? There is no study as such, as far as uh, I uh, know. But the logic is that if you control the diabetes, the chances of HCC would be less. Is there any study that you are aware of or any comments on that? Uh, I am not aware of any particular study, but we know that the presence of diabetes itself can increase the risk of uh, uh, liver cancer. Uh, I'm not sure uh, of any study whether the diabetes is better controlled, uh, less well controlled, to what degree is being controlled, that uh, the risk uh, of liver cancer would change. Uh, but I suspect uh, uh, overall, uh, the uh, underlying insult, uh, there's a bi-directional relationship between the fatty liver and the diabetes, and the underlying insult uh, is similar in a lot of ways. Uh, and together, as uh, the uh, liver disease is more severe, diabetes uh, is there, uh, the risk of having a complication like liver cancer will also increase. Yeah, we have uh, some more time left with us. <laughs> we can bombard uh, Chan with questions or any other, the other two speakers as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen, another uh, thought that uh, came into our mind, your Malaysian society involves the cardiologists and endocrinologists. Unfortunately, the uh, liver societies in other countries don't involve the cardiologists and endocrinologists. I think it should be a very important part of hepatologists representing their meetings so that they are more aware about this disease and we can prevent this disease in the long run. Maybe this is uh, for the future and youngsters like you can bring that up. There's also a term known as genetic associated fatty liver disease, Gaffield. Are you aware of that or... <laughs> Oh, it will be. <laughs> that's a whole area on itself. I, I suppose a whole symposium may not be enough to discuss that's right. that. That's uh, right. There are many uh, uh, genetic risk factors for fatty liver. That's right. Yes. So this is just for the information of the audience that this is not the end of it. Uh, many more uh, fatty liver diseases would come in the future. And Gaffield is something which is being spoken of. So, also drug induced fatty liver disease, etc. Yes. Well, anyway, I think it's time that we conclude the session. Thank you very much, each of the speakers. Unfortunately, my co-chair could not come because she's involved in another uh, uh, talk uh, in a, another session. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's done. It's done. We've done it. Okay, okay. Thank you. So much. Oh, yes, we should. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, speakers and moderators. Now we will have a coffee break. Coffee is served in front of the main hall. The next session will start at 3.30 p.m.